Very good. And I'm going to start my slides up. Okay. Um, well, we're having a little difficult. Oh, here we go. There we go. All right. And I should have a picture of myself somewhere, which I'm not seeing. Well, if you're sharing full screen, then you would only see that. Okay. Thank you, Misha. So yep. let me go ahead and introduce myself uh, very briefly. I'm uh, Rich Mako. I'm a neurologist at the University of Maryland. School of Medicine, and I'm co-appointed in medicine and physical therapy and rehabilitation. Uh, I'm also a chief scientific officer of a startup company, Next Step Robotics, and work very closely with Anindo Roy, a PhD, who's an MIT graduate and now a associate professor of neurology at University of Maryland, uh, working with me now 15 years on robotics. He's also down at uh, University of Maryland College Park, Clark School of Engineering, where he teaches uh, robotics in graduate programs. And Anindo is an IEEE senior member and the chief technical officer of uh, Next Step Robotics. I wanna start off with some disclosures as, as is the rule, uh, again, I'm a founding equity owner and have patents and serve as the chief scientific officer on Next Step Robotics. Uh, our group has a National Institute of Health, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, a U44 grant, which is a small business initiative for research for ankle robotics for the treatment of foot drop after stroke. And I'd like to add, thank the National Institute of Health for their uh, cooperative work in, in helping us move this forward. And this is a cooperative grant in which their brains and their, their input has been extremely valuable. I'm also a, a co-director of a neuromotor exercise and technologies core for the Claude D. Pepper Center at University of Maryland. And that's National Institute of Aging, and it focuses on functional independence in older Americans. And uh, this is something that's uh, very, very passionate about to try and bring technologies to, to older individuals. Uh, and my real drive, my real interest uh, that I'm talking about today is, is robotics uh, in, in individuals that have had neurological uh, diseases, particularly stroke. Uh, there are advances in the control systems of robotics that now allow us to apply these to people with injured central nervous systems. And that accompanied with the brain plasticity that's in the injured brain, uh, we can make huge differences for people. And this is all very recent developments. And these approaches that we're using for neurological rehabilitation and, and robotics and advanced control systems have profound implications for what could be done in the area of science fiction and for optimizing human performance way, way beyond just medical therapy. So I wanna start off with an outline of what I'll speak about today and that starts off with how big of a problem is stroke? Is there a need for new technologies such as robotics? And I'm gonna make a case that it's a huge global public health problem that's getting larger and larger. And that in fact, we're not doing the kinds of things we should do to help these people. That movement and the capability of moving should be a, a human right. And right now it's not. Secondly, are robotics and robotic exoskeletons smart enough to cooperate with stroke survivors to help recovery of walking? And I would broaden that to be able to say any other sort of functional movements, the arm, the whole body. 
And uh, how, what mechanisms enable those cooperations to occur on the side of the robot and the side of the adaptation that occurs in the human brain and body? So this brings us to questions of safety, questions of rules. What are the three laws of robotics after stroke? And do they differ from Asimov's three laws of robots, which many of you may track back to 70 years ago that may be universal? How are these relevant today? And finally, what are the brains of the robot? And I'm gonna make a case that it's the control systems because the control systems of robots indicate how they're gonna be able to adapt to humans under different circumstances and how humans can cooperate with them to optimize movements. I'm talking about human robotic cooperative learning. And I'm gonna make the case that the same, very same control systems that we're using for neurological uh, patients uh, could power Iron Man. Let's start off with how big of a problem is stroke. In the United States, there are over 800,000 new strokes per year. There are probably many, many more that go undetected and add up like grains of sand to take away cognitive function in older people, especially. There are over 5 million stroke survivors. This number is anticipated to double by 2050 with the aging of our population. And in fact, that's a global phenomena. Globally, stroke is 12 to 15 million new cases per year. And there are over 104 million stroke survivors. And this is data from the uh, global burden of uh, disease, which probably underestimates the amount of stroke in some case, but it's very well documented. This goes back to 2013. So th this number is just accumulating and rising. It's a third the size almost of the United States itself. There are 132 million disability adjusted life years lost to stroke. And that's massive. The lifetime risk for 25 year old persons is now estimated to be 24.9%. So this is something that affects far more people. And you can see the references for that at this very well studied right now. And it's a huge, huge unmet problem. So let's look at hemipretic gait. Uh, half paralysis is one of the most disturbing and disabling features of, of stroke disability, uh, where a hemispheric stroke occurs on one side, such as the right side of the body, and then the left side has a uh, what could very well be a permanent paralysis. What you're seeing here is a, a steppage gait where someone kicks their leg out in front of them and also circumducts or makes a circular motion because they cannot lift their foot. The knee is stiff because this, the muscles for that control flexion and extension are simultaneously paralyzed. And this person has at least a 70% chance of falling the first year out after their stroke, and they are permanently disabled for life. Uh, so functional independence is gone. They're, they're, they become very afraid to move out of their house and, and do things. It's, it's a serious, serious problem. So the question of all these millions of strokes, how many are left with residual disability? After we do our best with physical therapy and rehabilitation, to get them back on their feet. Well, six months out after the stroke, two thirds to 75% of stroke survivors are left with residual leftover disability that permanently impairs function. And the question is, can we do better than just routine stroke rehabilitation care? And technologies play into this role. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about technologies for mobility recovery and neurological disease. And I'm gonna start off with the ankle foot orthoses or AFO, and also then mention the more recent functional electrical stimulation. Okay, foot orthoses have been around since the time of Christ. They're several thousand years old. And these are the 
commonest, most common things that people use if they have foot drop, inability to walk well, as that prior slide showed, prior video showed, that's the most common thing that our people are given to help them from falling, to keep the foot lifted in the air. And the functional electrical stimulation device puts a, a small electrical current into the peroneal nerve that causes a lifting of the foot. These have been studied in, in large scale studies and they are both increased safety. They help people walk faster while you're wearing them, but they do not reverse foot drop. So we're talking about a safety device, an assistive device, but no restoration of volitional foot lift or the neurological control that the person has themselves. So canes are also classified as assistive devices. They're not therapeutic devices. And I'd like you to look at this picture of King Tut and his wife. Canes have been around for a very, very long time, since the time of the Egyptians. And that is what we give people to help them keep from falling and get around. And frankly, I think as science fiction and scientists, we should be ashamed of ourselves that we're sending people soon to Mars, but we can't figure out a better way to help individuals that have neurological disabilities, and there are millions of them, get around. And we're using technologies that are thousands of years old. So do robots hold promise? And I'd like to play a small clip from our collaborators, our former collaborators at MIT. Uh, and you'll see me on the treadmill very soon. I'm the one walking on the treadmill. Thanks for watching and stay with us. There's much more ahead on CNN, including today's edition of Pioneers. Take a look. MIT scientists Hermano Ego Krebs and Neville Hogan are using robots to help stroke victims with brain injuries regain movement. Their arm robots have already helped patients move shoulders and wrists, enabling them to do things they couldn't do for themselves, like shower or put on clothes. It isn't just a matter of moving. We are seeing something that looks like we're influencing a change in the brain. But I think that's probably the most important thing we've seen so far. Now they're focusing on the lower extremities with ankle bots, which they hope will not only help patients walk again, but also help avoid dangerous falls after their strokes. The robots work by providing a video game on a screen, which prompts users to perform an exercise. If they don't make that movement within a certain period of time, then the robot will initiate it. If they do make a movement within that period of time, the robot goes along and helps them. So what we think is happening is that the visual display evokes the intent to move. A short time later, movement actually happens, and that sensory information comes back up to the brain. A future goal is to one day have an entire robotic gym for all parts of the body. So the, these are some of our, our original collaborators. Uh, Neville Hogan uh, from MIT is uh, an inventor of impedance control, which is a new type of control uh, that, that he found works for neurological patients as a soft and cushy motor learning approach. And Hermano Ego Krebs that we collaborated with in the past for many, many years to develop the ankle robot. This is the sort of technology that includes human robotic cooperative learning. So we ask ourselves, can robots be used to push the envelope of neuromotor learning? Well, some of the earliest models of robotics used pattern generation. And I've, I've seen um, patients um, actually fall asleep on them because they may not engage volitional interaction uh, and efforts by the person themselves to try and relearn walking. It's not practice progression and pushing people. It's not like a sport where you're trying to change your, your level of control. And these actually have failed in clinical trials where physical therapy that does push you by very skilled therapists uh, that, that proved superior to some of these earlier models that were pattern generators across multiple joints. This raised questions, how do we engage volitional learning? Are these devices meant to be assistive, which just means while you're wearing them, they help you move? Or therapeutic, where they can actually teach the nervous system to do better, and you do better when you're not wearing the device? What kinds of robots should we use? 
Should we have them across multiple joints, single joints? What kind of control systems? And here are the brains of the robots, which I'll talk about soon, that is all of the importance in the world. And can we make them safe, stable, and effective to reshape walking recovery after CNS injury? Safe and stable. This brings us to Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics, which come from 1940 original thoughts and then put into a series of science fiction books, uh, primarily aimed at younger people in, in around 1950. And Asimov called them the Handbook of Robotics, 56th edition, 2058. So 70 years ago, they were ahead of our time. And Asimov considered these laws as intuitive. In other words, they should apply to any sort of automated device. A powered lawnmower should obey Asimov's three laws. And let me just look at those very quickly with you. A robot must not injure a human or through interaction allow a human to come to harm. So through inaction, allow a human to come to harm. So what this is, is primum non no serum, do, do no harm. Secondly, a robot must obey the orders given it by a human and being unless such orders would conflict with the first law. So the third one is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So we have three laws of robotics, which may be universal, and let's see systematically how these apply to what we call the new control systems and neurorobotics. Asimov's rule one, I believe it's dead on. It applies as much today as it did since the beginning of his reign as a premier science fiction writer. A co-robot must not injure a human or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. Stroke produces tremendous slowness, spasticity, which is co-contraction and rigidity, limited range of motion. And when Neville Hogan and his collaborators first saw stroke patients interacting with industrial robots that use velocity or position controls, they found that these were too rigid and stroke patients fought them. They were forcing the patients to move. They were not compliant. They were oftentimes uncomfortable and they could even be dangerous. They could force people into movements that were not correct for the impairments and the restrictions that they had on their motions. So this led them to a different kind of control system. Stroke patients have highly variable movements. Every step is different. And robotic support must be pre precisely timed. In other words, it must have sensors inside of it to trigger the actuators to go off at the correct time. Otherwise, inaction or improper timing can and will destabilize movement. And there are studies in able-bodied individuals that show precisely the same thing. So let's start off with how do we deal with Asimov's rule number one? We align the technology with the neuroscience of gait. We do not impose motion. We give volitional task practice and don't suppress passive joint mechanics. And we do this using impedance control, which is a, a moving box control with a coupled stability. It's assist as needed. Get out of the way if you don't, if the human can do it themselves. But most of the time for an impaired person, it's the cooperation or the combination of the human and the robot moving within a very defined track. Let me show you what I mean. Much of locomotion arises from gravito-inertial mechanics. That means the interaction of gravity and inertia and suppressing these natural limb and joint biomechanical dynamics cannot lead to recovery. And the, what I'm showing you here is a, a classic picture of a, a device that simulates the controlled falling and the biomechanics that occurs to a great degree in human gait. And so here we go. Uh, 
I can usually tell pretty quickly whether it's going to go or not. So what you're seeing here is that there's a natural biomechanics with gravito inertial forces that, that can make a non-powered device move. And humans and any mammal, anything that moves has many of those gravito inertial mechanics built into it. You do not want to fight mother nature. You want to be able to exploit that and move along with it. Now, you have to not just consider the passive forces of gravito inertial. You must also consider the nervous system and how it's wired. And robots absolutely have to interact with the nervous system in order to make things better. This slide shows a cat that's um, walking on a treadmill belt. And many years ago, they found out, and it's walking at different speeds, that you can cut the spinal cord of a cat in its mid high thoracic region, completely cut the, the spinal cord and the cat can still walk. It can be taught to walk on a treadmill. And the walking on a treadmill is driven by uh, neural networks that integrate oscillating sensory and motor information that are actually in the spinal cord themselves. And in the human, those are located in the midbrain. It's part of the brain stem. And those actually drive an oscillating sensory and motor network. And a robot has to account for these oscillating networks in order to be able to control a human. And, and anything with, with reality or science fiction has to consider the fundamentals of the intrinsic neural network systems and how they drive. So let me give you an example of a moving box control. And what you're seeing is that as a person moves, they may stray from the path that they're supposed to take. But when they get toward the end of that path, such as reaching functionally or stepping, you got to pull them back in. You got to pull them back in quickly so that they don't fall and so, or, or miss their target. And so the moving box control looks at where a person is and it can apply stiffness which is the amount of force like a spring or damping, the rate that that force is applied to be able to get a person to move within a box, to move within a certain frame that allows for safe and effective function. That's called impedance control. And impedance control is interaction control uh, between a manipulator and the environment. And this is the MIT Manus arm robot, and you can see the manipulator and the environment that's created with it. And without going into the technical information about how this works, is what you really have is a spring and a damper for moving box control. And the spring is how much force, and the damper is the rate of that force. It's basically a function of time. And if you get ahead of that force and can do it on yourself, it backs out of the way. So it's back drivable or assist as needed. And it has turned into the gold standard for human robotic cooperative learning because it allows a person to interact with a robot. 12 weeks of human robot arm cooperative learning is equal to intensive occupational therapy. Now, that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, but it's not been done for the lower extremity. So what our group did initially in working with MIT and then moving on with University of Maryland and an engineering team is developed an ankle exoskeleton uh, for stroke recovery, which attached rotary encoders to a knee brace and then through a ball joint used the two drivers, which were virtual screwdrivers, to be able, with a brushless DC motor, to be able to control movement up and down and inversion and eversion, or tilting the ankle in and out. And the concept behind this is to use the same drivers as are in the MIT Manus arm robot, but to put those kind of controllers for human robotic cooperative learning into the leg, to see if the leg can learn, to see if after a stroke, the leg can learn. And so for severely impaired people that can't walk or that had a really bad ankle function, we would set them up in a 
actually what turned out to be a dentist chair. We did no teeth drilling. We had them do a seated video game therapy in which they were to be able to try and follow and move the moving ball into the target zone in inversion, eversion, that's side tilting in and out and up and down movements. And that we looked at as a concept. Can we have proof of concept that the, that the impaired leg can learn and how many years out after a stroke? For mild to moderate, we used robot assisted treadmill training. And here's a, a picture of the seated video game in which a person is moving their foot and the robot assists them if they can't do it themselves, but the robot doesn't get them all the way there. It gets them most of the way there. They're pushing them. And this is adapted to the, the deficit severity of the person so they get the correct targets about 75 or 80% of the time. That way they get a reinforcement. And as they get better at it, the task can be made more difficult. And it's very easy to measure their level of, of effectiveness and, and modify the robot according to their level of disability to create a progressive challenge and motor learning with goal setting and feedback. So we did 18 one hour sessions that counted 560 targeted movements per, per session. And what we found was a dramatically improved control of the paralyzed ankle, even years out after a stroke. And we've done people out to 20 or 30 years out. So there is hope for recovery of injured nervous system. And we found out there was an increase in self-selected walking speed, which without the robot on, people walk better over the ground. And there were improved biomechanics of the walking itself. So this seemed to translate over the ground walking and that's done in a cohort of stroke patients. And here's an example of the movement profile of people in, uh, in, in plantar flexion that's pushing the foot down. It's very, very slow. It's really heterogeneous. They're all over the place. And after six weeks of training, it's much faster. It's much sharper. And this is the same thing for what foot lift looked like on a stroke patient. And then after the training, you can see these, these series of movements are much more accurate and much more precise. So let's go to Asimov's second robot rule. A robot must obey the orders given by a human being unless such orders conflict with the first law. In co-robotics or human robotics cooperative learning, this becomes a robot must adapt to the movement orders given it by a human being unless such orders conflict with the first law. So the only thing we're swapping out is you must adapt to the movement orders. This is cooperative robotics. So let's go back to the needs and the solution. Loc locomotion is rhythmic, requires intermittent contact and adaptive timing control to time assist to the events. That's deficit adjusted, that deals with foot drops, swaying, all the problems that occur with stroke. And now I'm gonna take you to what adaptive timing control is. Adaptive timing means when your heel strike occurs, your foot better be cleared. When your heel comes off, you really wanna push. You want some push because that gives you forward propulsion to keep your gait symmetrical and moving forward. And at the toe off, you want to be able to stop that push. So what you have to do is build sensors into the bottom of the shoe or, or whatever device what, what the robot is using in combination with the human that create this cyclical movement that overlays itself with intermittent contact over top of normal human walking. And it's controlled the timing precisely to when the person moves, it's not its own pattern generator, it's watching the person and moving according to their movements. And let me give you an example here again of what hemipretic stroke looks like, is this severe gait disturbance and uh, uh, of inability to lift up the leg and the, the, the gait is stepping out forward and the foot is not lifting and there's a uh, hemiparesis across the knee and spasticity. And here's a person the same day walking with the ankle robot on and what you're gonna see, and this is a very impaired person, is a, a much, much more rapid movement. The foot is being assisted. The person may be doing 10, five, 10% of that lift. The robot's doing 90% of it. And then it's the person has a better forward projection of their other leg because now they have a rocker motion that's controlled by cyclical 
walking. And this this gate here is much, much nor more normal than this gate. That's called a two step where both legs land right next to each other. And the, the paralyzed leg is more or less being used as a crutch. And this one you see much more of a controlled forward walking uh, that takes advantage of the person's existing strength and in combination with the robot gets them moving the right way. So now we have four positive clinical trials uh, that we've done in, a, in chronic stroke and they average six months out after their stroke or I'm, 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 I'm sorry, six years out after their stroke. And we've done subacute stroke within an average of 12 days after their stroke and shown improvement in ankle motor control and overground walking in all, all of these cases. And they are small series, but they're what you call grade A evidence because we do have randomized clinical trials with this ankle robot. One of the things that you're seeing here on the right hand side of the slide is the paretic swing and, and the uh, what angle is the foot. And at the beginning, it's very, very low and many people it's negative. And after training, you see that the angle of the foot goes up higher and it's and the angle of initial contact goes much higher. So you're not hitting your toe when you land. And six weeks after the therapy done, that's all retained. And the frequency of heel first foot strikes and your heel should hit first may start off very, very low, but it starts to go up to near 99%. So we're doing what Asimov says, giving a safer walking pattern. And these tests are done with a person wearing no robot. This is six weeks out after they've stopped all therapy. And this is after six weeks of training three times a week. They're not wearing the robot. We've changed their intrinsic volitional motor control towards safety. And this occurs across a profile of what we call a learning curve in which the ankle robot walking on a treadmill starts off very low in the terms of its percentage of, of, of increase in uh, dorsiflexion or foot lift. And after about maybe a couple of weeks, you start to see that without any assistance, the person is lifting their foot up higher. And this motor learning solidifies by the end of the training so they can have a good foot lift without the robot helping them. And then six weeks later, this is retained after all training has been completed six weeks later. And that's a very, very positive sign that people are using their foot correctly in the real world and maintaining those gains. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. We're gonna modify that and say that a robot must protect the integrity of its own control systems. The control systems are the brain. And it must be able to, con control uh, systems have to be able to work in different environments as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So again, minimal modification of Asimov's made for co-robotics. And, this is a bit of a busy slide, but what you're seeing up here in the left is that there's a heel strike, a heel off and a toe off. And sensors in the bottom of the shoe need to know when those are occurring so that they can control the timing and the direction of the movement through an impedance controller. And that goes to a graphical user interface that a therapist or a patient can see. And that, uh, that combination of impedance control that assist is needed, human robot cooperative learning with adaptive control to allow it to adapt to different circumstances and to each individual movement of the person. That's an embedded advanced control system that allows the nervous system, even with an injured brain to interact with it and, and create control. And here you have an example of what this looks like for heel and toe clearance. Now watch the heel and the toe. This patient that has serious foot drop is just clearing the heel and toe by centimeter, a couple centimeters. This is a very, very, very tight um, control that can occur in a person that normally would drag their foot because the robot's timing is looking at exactly what they're doing along the way. So that's heel and toe clearance. Now let's look at swing clearance because you have to be able to control that foot in the air, that's the swing. So look at the clearance 
And again, this is a completely different set of needs that's occurring during a different phase of the walking cycle that has to be precisely controlled. So the control systems have to work across different phases of the walking cycle and across different environments. And what does that give you? And it gives you an ability for the robot control systems to work with seated therapy for very severely impaired people. Treadmill, which gives you a artificial walking environment, but more systematic and controlled than over ground or on top of devices where they're suspended. We went down to uh, Flenny Neurological Rehabilitation Institute in Argentina and put this on a patient that had a stroke three years prior. And this guy took off like a rocket. And he started walking up and down their physical therapy steps, uh, which they had at, at this facility. And it made me nervous because those steps, I didn't know whether or not we were medical legally covered. But you can see people have to use the robot and its control systems under different environments to make it work. So human-robot interactions, co-robotics, human-robotic cooperative robotics can shape central nervous system recovery and function. There is great A evidence of that, and that is part of the future of neurological rehabilitation. It's very clear now that we've learned from neurological patients that collaboration between an, a human and a robot is the optimal way to go ahead and produce precise control. And precision control of human robotics cooperative learning goes way, way beyond rehabilitation. And for those of you that have an interest, look into the nationalsciencefoundation.gov, look up co-robotics, uh, Human robotics interaction is the broader topic. Human robotic cooperative learning is a subset of that. And this is being applied to many, many different types of, of uh, application needs. So I then ask, as we start to summarize, what can we learn from cooperative robotics after stroke to be able to innovate more broadly? The injured central nervous system, I'm gonna say, is a much harder target to enhance movement than a healthy human being, but the same robot laws apply. A co-robot must not injure a human or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. Thank you, Isaac Asimov. A co-robot must collaborate or cooperate with the volitional movements given it by the human being. It must work with the gravito-inertial biomechanics that are natural, and it must integrate itself with consideration to the oscillating sensory and motor neural circuits. It must collaborate with how nature made movement unless such orders would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its control systems as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And it must do these control systems protections under different types of environments in order to meet the diverse needs of humans in different settings. So what are our next steps? What do we have in the works? We have portable power with a high capacity battery, a portable control with a system on a chip. We have reduced mass, the system is two pounds. Uh, we have back drivability with gearless actuators. So in case a person runs into a circumstance where their power hitting on their leg is too high, it shuts itself off. It minimizes slippage. And it has clinical usability. This is uh, one of the things we'd like to do to introduce an ankle robot in to uh, the real world with wireless communication. We built machine learning into it so that every 20 steps, we can see how much the robot is doing and how much the human is doing and adapt it. We have a randomized clinical trial in the planning and we will collect metadata and develop artificial intelligence analyses from how neuromotor recovery occurs to create the first artificial intelligence repository of neuromotor recovery informed precisely by the robots and assisted by the smart and skilled physical therapists that use this so that we can really see what's happening with nervous system recovery on the horizon we will integrate this with functional exercise to increase the diversity of the movements that people can do. We already have an arm robot under works. And 
we are going to be approaching neuroorthopedic foot drop from peripheral nerve injury, from spinal problems. We have some interest in multiple sclerosis, movement disorders, spinal cord injury. I'd like all of you to think as science fiction and scientists that our patent is exoskeleton control across any impaired joint. That means we could apply impedance control, adaptive control with sensory motor feedback across one joint or multiple joints, individually or all at the same time. So this brings us to what would you do? What, what would you as science fiction writers or scientists, what would you build? What would you have us build to be able to help people better? Which applications make sense? Industrial, military, space, safety, aging? What's the role in science fiction? Talk to me. I can be reached at this email at Next Step Robo because uh, this is sort of the beginning of a revolution in advanced engineering design. And I'll stop there and take questions. Mr. Macko, can you see the Q&A tab? Q&A tab, yes. Okay, we have three questions directed to you so far in there. Okay, so I'm gonna answer this live. Uh, thank you, Michael. Absolutely, um, can this be applied to prosthetics? If a person has had an amputation be below the knee, so the lower leg, ankle and foot are artificial. So uh, Michael, I would like you to look up um, the TED talk that had uh, a dancer who had an amputation below the knee after being injured in the Boston Marathon bombing. And you will be able to know that impedance control developed in collaboration by MIT investigators, including Neville Hogan that inspired much of our work, created the control systems that allowed the diversity of that dancer to be able to dance again with a prosthetic below the leg. There are tremendous opportunities for this to be used for prosthetics and to couple it multi-segmentally along the body. I hope I've um, answered that one. Should I click done? The first person didn't seem to be bending his knee much, if at all. Are there future plans to add knee flexion to the co-robotics? I'm going to answer this live. And I'm going to say this. We, we have done three-dimensional uh, motion analysis, uh, which, which involves uh, multiple cameras uh, taking pictures with joint markers in place. Uh, while looking at force plates to study what's called inverse dynamics, uh, looking at what happens up the body. In other words, when you move the ankle better, does it influence uh, movement up higher at the knee? And yes, the first person does not seem to be bending their knee much, if at all, because spasticity is present in the, in the hamstrings and the uh, quadriceps that, paralyze, that kind of freezes the leg up. What we've found across, and that was a single session that you were watching, what we found across six weeks of training is that for those people that had a reduced range of motion at the knee, the angular velocity and angular range of motion at the knee does look like it gets better. So across training, which I didn't wasn't capable of showing you in this limited talk, we absolutely do see that for those where it's broken, in other words, it's not bending enough, there is an increase in movement so the kinematic chain up higher above the ankle is affected. Yes, we have been thinking for years now about adding knee flexion to the co-robotics because some people have what you call genu recurvatum. They have too much knee hyperextension and they also are frozen there. And so if we time those together, we believe actually the same motor, the same uh, DC brushless motor could be used in both circumstances to be able to to drive knee flexion. And I wanna tell you that we're very interested in the arm because when you move the arm, 
in a, a in a reciprocal fashion with the leg balance is so much better and so much more stable and we do have the capacity to make wearable devices to make the arm and the leg move in harmony which will make people absolutely move better and i have done this manually with many stroke survivors that have a hemipretic arm so moving other segments of the body is absolutely on our our wish list we can only do so much in uh a corporate development at a, at a, at a, with the, the time and money that we have, uh, especially with the COVID crisis, but these things are very much on our mind. Thank you for the question. How could this assist people in space with the loss of gravity? Well, I'll tell you what we are very interested in is that we could mathematically model the forces that occur with loss of gravity into those sorts of forces that are seen across moving joints to be able to counter the loss of gravity so that the biomechanical forces that the body sees for large muscle groups are more uh, healthy. So we think that in the future for a prolonged time in space that um, impedance control with mathematical equations built into it that adapt to each person, a machine learning, a precision machine learning that learns how a person moves could be designed to measure and provide the kinds of forces that would simulate uh, a partial or a full gravity circumstance to be able to promote actual better health and even be able to manipulate it so that that gravity circumstance went away if you needed the gravity to go away for certain tasks and functions. Can this be applied to providing joint support for problems such as arthritis that don't involve neurological issues? Uh, thank you, Jim Edwards Hewitt. That is something that our uh, rheumatology experts and other individuals that I've spoken with that are dealing with knee osteoarthritis have asked me. And I would tell you that the joint forces that are seen at the bottom of the foot and that go up the foot and across the knee are very, very abnormal. And they're abnormal on the side that has bad arthritis. And the non-arthritic side obviously is part of the oscillating system. What we've found with stroke survivors is that we have a capability of changing the profile of foot force is seen across the bottom of the foot. Over a six week period of time, we can lengthen them out and increase them in both length and in time. In other words, we can soften the landing. We believe that this could change the forces that occur across the arthritic joint. And we'll leave, we believe we may be able, able to train the kind of torsional forces that are seen in the diabetic foot so we can change foot forces, which become pathologically abnormal, and those lead to ulcers and ultimately infections and amputations. So we have a sort of a team of people looking at other medical applications on this. We started with stroke because that's where we um, kind of uh, have our greatest expertise. But thank you, and we are on it, and we're going to push it. Excuse me, sir. Two-minute warning. So thank you, Renee. And I'm going to go to Catherine. So much of posture revolves around pelvic and torso stability. This seems a difficult area for prosthetic support. Short of electrical stimulation. Is this an area that you've looked at? Yes, Catherine. What we know is that the ankle is very good for um, short distance, but large movements require uh, a, a hip strategy. And this is part of the strategies that are used by physical therapists and biomechanists. And we actually developed a pelvis robot in combination with MIT that allows more degrees of freedom up higher to be able to train people for more complex tasks. But we have not pursued that uh, to make it into a commercial application because we're doing one at a time. And um, the integration of multiple concurrent robots seems difficult for the human to control. When does information overload start? Information overload starts as soon as you don't consider the multi-segmental motor control of the human being as a whole. And with machine learning to be able to integrate the precise movements 
that one individual has, and for every person, they're going to be different, to be able to average those and use things like engineering models, like internal models to predict where the next movement is going to be based on multi-segmental coherence of movements, you will overload. But engineering models already exist. You can look up one that I'm on called J. Barton and the American uh, Journal of Biomechanics that's a 13-segment uh, multi-segmental motor for uh, motor control. And I think we're out of time. Yes, sir. I'm afraid that is time. Uh, I have other questions. Maybe I can catch those another t uh, offline somehow. But thank you all for your for your interest. I've had a wonderful time. It's my first Balticon, and I hope I can do it again someday. Soon. <laughs>